Thank you so much, Anya, for the very kind introduction. I hope that you can see my slides okay and in full screen mode. And actually, I would like to start off my presentation by congratulating the current ESA team on all the fantastic progress you guys have made over the last years. And it's really cool to see how amazing the ESA has made progress and advanced in these last years since I was a member years ago. So. I have structured my talk into three parts. I would like to tell you a little bit about what my job actually is at the moment. So what does Berlinger do as a company and what is my job in detail? Then I'm gonna move on to um, talking about how I got there and what my motivations were along the way. And as a third part, I have prepared some tips for you that I think could be helpful if you aspire to um, getting a similar job. So let's get started with the what. And I want to introduce um, the company I work for. So Berlinger Ingelheim is a family-owned corporation. They have always been a family business, and they are actually very proud that they are still family-owned. And they have three focus areas. So um, they work on human pharmaceuticals, but also on animal health and on biopharmaceutical contract manufacturing. Worldwide, BI has 52,000 employees. And of these 52,000 employees, um, roughly 8,800 work in R&D, so in research and development. Um, in the year 2020, uh, BI has spent roughly 3.7 billion euros on the R&D arm. Now, since Beringa is involved in every step of the process, um, that means that we are involved from discovering targets to discovering molecules, develop the, developing them into drugs, um, testing them extensively, and then all the way to testing them in the clinics, um, and finally also marketing them. For this, um, Berlinger has 16 production sites spread around the globe, and we have 176 affiliated companies. In 2020, uh, net sales of BI um, were roughly 19.6 billion euros, of which 14.4 billion euros came from human pharmaceuticals. Um, to get, together, this um, also attributes to the fact that BI is currently one of the top 20 pharmaceutical companies worldwide. Now, the research sites of BI are uh, located across the globe. There is the research site in Richfield in the US. Then there's the one um, in Biberach, uh, the one in Vienna where I work, and the one in Kobe in Japan. In my daily work, I collaborate closely with colleagues from the R&D sites in Biberach and in Richfield. And in addition to the BI research sites, the company has also acquired several uh, biotech companies that have now in, been included under the umbrella of BI, for example, MBE Therapeutics in Basel, or Amal in Geneva, and also Vira T located in Innsbruck. So the goal of cancer research in BI is to develop drugs that target proteins that are very commonly deregulated in cancer. So as you can see on the slide, um, there is millions of cancer patients with mutations in KRAS or beta catenin signaling. And together with P53 and MYC, KRAS and beta catenin are termed cancer speak four because they are most commonly altered. Until several years ago, these targets, um, however, were deemed undruggable because they lack the proper binding pocket for drugs. But with the recent advances in medicinal chemistry and structural biology, we are now finally finding ways to actually drug these previously undruggable targets. And BI's focus is on doing that with small molecules, so NCEs, but also with antibodies or antibody-like biological entities. So as to what my job actually is, I'm currently an associate principal scientist in the department Oncology Translational Sciences. So in my daily work, my main task is to lead a team of lab scientists. That means that I am not in a lab anymore myself, but much rather I design lab experiments, I analyze data, um, and I do a lot, I spend a lot of my time in meetings actually. Um, discussing projects and project work. Um, and all of this, um, I do this with the help of a really great team of lab scientists. So the main 
task is to profile drugs candidates in the stage just before they enter the first clinical trial. So mainly we identify biomarkers and we aim at establishing PKPD relationships. So what does that mean? That means that um, we try to gather data from in vitro studies, but also from in vivo studies, mainly in mice. And we try to understand the relationship of the pharmacokinetics with the pharmacodynamics so that we understand what amount of those we need to use to get a certain effect so that once we go into the clinic, we have a rough idea of what those we have to treat the patient with to get the expected outcome. So I mainly develop uh, biomarker strategies. I validate them um, after developing them preclinically. So that's mainly done with in vitro um, experiments and mouse models. And we validate them in order to support um, the initial clinical trials. Furthermore, I collaborate closely with academic partners and contract research organizations. And this is in order to um, investigate new technologies that can be used to discover new biomarkers. Now, moving on to the second part of my talk is how I got to having this job and, and, and what my motivation was along the way. So as was mentioned in the introduction, um, I obtained a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry um, from the Graz University of Technology. And I already um, realized during my bachelor's studies that I had an interest in biochemistry. So um, I then did a master's degree in biochemistry, also again at the Graz University of Technology. During my master's, I already um, did a master thesis in cancer research. And I knew that I wanted to do also a PhD in that field. So I applied for a PhD program at the Medical University of Graz. And I, after finishing my PhD there um, in basic research, I stayed on for a postdoc in the field of tumor biology. After that, I wanted to transition to the industry. And after applying to many different jobs and having a rough time going through all the interviews, I finally landed a job in a small biotech startup um, located here in Vienna called OncoOne. Um, OncoOne is a company that works on antibodies and antibody-based therapeutics. So I got to learn a lot about NDEs there. And in June of last year, I finally was able to um, transition to BI and I hold this position as an associate principal scientist since last year. Now, as you can see on the top of the slide, this is like my formal CV, but I also wanna mention what I consider um, equally important. And those are the things that I did outside of my uh, formal education. So for example, in 2011, um, I got the opportunity to do a research stay um, at Syracuse University, that's um, in the state of New York in the US, was like a summer exchange program between chemistry students from Graz and Syracuse. Um, and a year later, uh, I had the opportunity of doing an EIS internship at Cardiff University. And this was actually one of the first um, real um, experiences I had in, in, doing, in, re in doing research in the biofield, basically. Another really cool thing that I got the opportunity to participate in was a biocamp organized by Sando uh, in Slovenia. And that was like a super intense experience, but it was super rewarding. Um, it was about um, immunotherapy and it had like a competition where we had to come up you know, with a presentation on, on a topic. And finally, last but not least, I wanted, want to mention that I was actually part of the um, ESA South branch. Um, from, I think, 2016 to 2019, where, um, where that Pascal set up back at the time. And as a member of the ESA South branch, um, I had the opportunity to organize, like, you know, science dinners. And um, I also organized a company visit to Sando, where I used these contacts that I had from the biocamp. Now, since I'm a scientist, I want to talk to you a little bit about the science I actually did during my time in academia. And this is mostly um, to give you a bit of perspective and to encourage you if you have the feeling that whatever you're doing right now is just basic research, which is often the case. Um, but nevertheless, it can really lay the groundstone for your future work. So during my master thesis, I um, did some cell culture work. I tested some plant extracts 
Um, they were really nicely killing the cells in the Petri dish. And I even got a little paper out of it. And, and I remember um, wondering back then already, like, okay, this is great. These compounds to kill the cells in vitro, but what's going to happen now? Like, okay, I published it, but I'm moving on to the next stage. Who's ever going to read this? And who is ever going to do anything with that? All the truth is probably nobody ever read it. So then I moved on to my PhD. I did a PhD um, in basic research investigating colorectal cancer. And specifically, I was looking at various uh, chi protein coupled receptors. So we knocked them out in the mice and then induced colorectal cancer in these mice and checked whether the mice uh, would grow less tumors and so on. And so basically, this was um, very, very basic research. And in my postdoc time, I got to mentor a brilliant PhD student, Melanie, and together with her, uh, we would do multiple mouse models where, so syngenetic mouse models where we would engraft cell lines in the flank of the mice, let them grow for two weeks, um, and then extract the tumors, um, digest them, and look at the tumor infiltrating uh, leukocytes by doing some fancy flow cytometry. All right. so. Now I want to move on to the to the last part of my talk, um, where I've collected what I would say are some tips. They are really just personal tips that I would like to give to you. So one of the things I've experienced uh, while applying for Berlinga was that you do have to be academically excellent to be considered for a position at BI. So in that regard, it's really important that you have a proper track record. That means that you can show that you have published in good journals, that you have published multiple things. Um, and ideally that maybe your uh, scientific work was also awarded with some prizes along the way, like maybe poster, best poster awards or best talk awards um, or, or those kind of awards. Um, and ideally um, you can also show some international experience. It, now, I know this is a difficult topic sometimes. Um, do I have to go abroad? Do I not have to go abroad? Um, but it's really something that they pay attention to when you apply to them. And now, the second most important thing, or maybe it is even the most important thing, I'm not sure, but I would say it's networking. And I know you've all heard this a lot probably, and by being here today, you're definitely on the right path. But I wanna emphasize it just one more time because I think it's really so important that you do it and that you do it from early onwards. So if you have the chance, um, go to those conferences, go to student conferences if you can, even while you're still a master's student. Um, try to participate in student organizations if you have the opportunity. Um, as you can see here, these are just pictures I, 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 I wanted to share because they are from my time when I was a member of the ESA South branch, um, when together with Pascal and Melanie and Julian, we were organizing back in the day some science dinners or some you know, other excursions. Um, and another thing I would like to highlight is that I, I have made the, had the experience that having a LinkedIn profile is also very important. So not just having one, but actually making it meaningful, like creating content on your LinkedIn profile, because people, when they receive your CV and they want to talk about, they want to find out more about you, they will go and Google you, or they will go and find out um, or look up your LinkedIn profile. And having a LinkedIn profile that, that just shares a little bit about your experience, your education and so on can be really useful for people to get a first glimpse of, of your skills. And then another thing I would like to mention is that I consider it very important that you, if you think about switching from um, academia to industry, that you do what I would call active transitioning. So uh, by that, I mean that you find a way to show your future employer that you really want to work in the industry, meaning that you're not just running away from academia because you get sick and tired of it. No, much rather that you did some extra work to understand what it would be like working in the industry, um, what the differences are, and um, really showing this active interest in, in, in transitioning. And, and I've just listed here a few things that I think you could do is like taking extracurricular courses, 
There are some that uh, on Coursera, for example, that are quite helpful. Um, there is this blog from Native Jobs that is super helpful if you don't have any idea yet of what you want to do. They describe all kinds of jobs that you can do with a scientific background. Um, and then also, yeah, like attending events like you are doing today, you're on the right path. And so, for example, I attended the ESA event that was um, held in March last year, um, which was a full day workshop by BI. And I attended that and, I, and that was really helpful for me. And as my final message to you, uh, I would like to say that it is important to stand out. If you have anything about yourself that is extraordinary, make them see it. Because um, BI as an employer, they receive so many CVs and they receive so many excellent CVs that all look the same. They're all filled with academic accomplishment, with um, staying abroad experiences and so on. So if you have anything about yourself that makes you stand out, that makes them want to read your CV or your application, that is really, really helpful. Um, and also, well, as you know, it can be really, really tough to get to where you want to be. The path of doing a PhD, doing a postdoc, the interviewing and all of that, it's very often not so easy. So that's why I put here that you also should not forget to live a little. And with this, I'm at the end of my talk, and I'd like to invite you to ask me any of your questions. Thank you, Karina, for your very nice talk and for sharing your experiences. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and as I said, let's move to the Q&A session. Are there any questions in the chat, maybe? OK, maybe then I can start. Uh, can you describe your normal day? Uh, as an associate principal. So you said you don't work in the lab anymore, right? Yes, so that, that's mm -hmm. true. I don't work in the lab anymore. Um, I basically spend um, all my day at the computer or like, you know, now with COVID times, it's, it's all in online meetings, I think in normal times. So I was onboarded during the pandemic, right? So I have only experienced it in pandemic times. So I don't know what it would be like or what it will be like once we come back to the office. Um, but since I joined, I've mostly uh, worked from home, actually. Um, we are supposed to come back uh, on site 50% of the time as soon as the pandemic situation allows it. Um, and, but still, most of my work is um, designing experiments, analyzing data, being in meetings with other project team members. So in BI, projects are organized in so-called project teams. That means that a person of each function is represented there. So you have all the different disciplines together working on a project. Um, and depending on the stage that the project is in, the meetings are of course a bit different. But in my job, uh, basically I, I deal with uh, drug candidates that are um, already gone through the lead identification stage and are in the lead optimization stage. So we try to get them ready in terms of profiling so that they can enter the first clinical trial. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and I see we have some questions in the chat. So first question is by Melanie and she wonders, can you tell a little bit about the interview process? Was something challenging or surprising? Yes, of course I can walk you through that. So I'm um, gonna be honest with you, it took me four attempts to get the position that I got now. So meaning that I have applied to BI four times before uh, I got this position. Um, and the first two times I was really just turned down right from the beginning. So I didn't even make it past this initial stage uh, of just submitting your document. Um, and what was different the time around when I actually got the position is that um, I had my former bachelor supervisor already working at BI and I contacted, contacted her the moment I heard about the position that I applied for and I asked her for more details. If she could share with me um, what, the, what the work, what the job was gonna be about um, or if she knew any of the people that were actually hiring. And that was really the key element in the end because she knew the people of, of that department and she talked to them and they literally went and checked out my LinkedIn profile right away. And then they saw, okay, that I did a bachelor's in chemistry and that resonated well with them because it's really important even at a, a job 
um, in translational sciences to be able to talk to the chemists. Um, and, and so this really was the first step into getting invited for the next round that, um, yeah, they had me, they, that they looked me up and that I had my former supervisor make them look at my profile and, and see and see it. Um, and then the process was that I was invited for a, a like a telephone call, although it wasn't teams, but it was like a, a one hour session where I had to present the highlights of my research. So that was quite crazy for me because I had already been working in the industry for two years and I had to go back to my PhD data, you know, the, the PhD data, the postdoc data that I hadn't been thinking about in two entire years, but I had to put them back together in a slide and, you know, sell them um, in, a, in like a 10 minute presentation to show what I did academically. Um, even though I thought I would never have to deal with that ever again. But then I was invited to a six hour interview where I was um, where the first point of the agenda was to give a 45 minute presentation about my academic work. And again, you know, all I had was the work from the PhD and the postdoc that I was allowed to talk about. So then I really had to, um, you know, read my thesis again and um, put together a proper presentation um, with data that had been generated like, I don't know, six, seven years ago. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then you just you finish your talk, and then you go through one-on-one -on -one interviews, um, and it lasts on, on average it lasts like six hours. This interviews, um, and then later on they notify you about the outcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There is another question uh, by Jose. If the academic background is not directly on pharma but related, for example, analytical chemistry, is there a chance to join BI? In your opinion. I would say so. I mean, um, BI also has positions in the analytical department, right? So we also need um, people who work in, uh, with different skills and so on. So for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and Dina is asking, uh, how did you make your CV stand out? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point. And I, what I would say is that maybe not so much my CV stood out, but I managed to get to talk to people, you know? So, um, and, and, and this is, I think this is one of the most important things that I took away from it is um, take advantage of the networking opportunities you have. Like I myself attended the OGMBT conferences in Graz, in Vienna. And I think these are really such key moments because you get to meet so many people from the industry um, in the, because of the way that the meetings are organized with all these stands you had in pre-pandemic times again. Uh, but where you got to connect with uh, representatives of the industry um, and where you have this social event scheduled in, where you have the, the wine, the science in the evening, the wine time and so on. Uh, and this is where you really get to make those connections and where you start having people that, you know, later on can put as a reference maybe on your CV or who who could even like vouch for you, who, who I've, so I've had this experience that I, I knew someone who would then vouch for me and saying, yeah, like, she's really good. Like, you should really give her the job because I've had this and this experience with her. I've told her this and this and she had issues and then we did troubleshooting together and so on. And she's like, really, whatever. But so I think these are the, the, the key moments. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the last question by Yulia. Oh, no, not last question, but let's say last <laughs> question. Uh, when switching from science to industry, what was the biggest culture shock for you? Um, there are many, I'm not going to lie. There are many, it's, it's very different, um, in the industry. Um, the pace is much faster in terms of what, during your PhD, you've got roughly three to four years to work on your project and you really focus on this one project and you have a beginning. And, and if you don't have to change projects in between, then you have one project that you're working on for really three to four years. Um, and in the industry, the pace is faster, like um, priorities change all the time, you know, and have to be able to adapt to that because um, management might have to focus on this particular project now and then everything needs to happen now. Resources are shifted to accommodate for that. But if a project isn't going well, they are much quicker to also terminate them. So then you need to refocus and you might be put on another project. Um, so I think that that's one of the, the most, so in your daily life, you feel that the most, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And now the last question by Marie. Uh, do you think it's easier to switch to industry after PhD or after postdoc? Postdocs in big 
in the big pharma companies are incredibly competitive. Yes, I absolutely agree with that. Um, for BI, uh, you have to have a postdoc, that's clear. So I tried applying the first time while I was in my first year of postdoc, and that was just not interesting to them at all. They want you to have postdoc experience, um, roughly four years of experience. Post-PhD is the average where people start in this kind of um, leadership roles like a um, principal scientist is. So for me, obviously, it was not four years of postdoc, but it was like two years of postdoc and two years in the industry. Um, that ultimately got, got, gave me the opportunity to get this job, but uh, it might be different for other companies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, well, I guess that's it uh, for the Q&A session. Now we move to the uh, next talk. And I would like to remind again uh, our attendees to fill in the feedback for Karina. And now uh, let me introduce Julia. Head of the HR and controlling at ASIP, Julia Studensky is an HR expert of professional development with the vast experience in accounting, financial management, marketing, and public relations. Today, Julia will share her tips and tricks about the most common questions in a job interview. And before Julia uh, continues with her presentation, I would also like to uh, read her uh, description of the talk that she will give us today. If you were a pizza, which topping would you be? Looking forward to sharing insights on the most common job interview questions. It won't be about, this is how you should answer. The internet is full of this. It will be about the intention behind a particular type of question. Because knowing this, it is much easier to deal with any type of question, even a paradox one. And then Yulia decided she would be Margarita, classical and good. Yulia, whenever you are ready, please share your screen. Thank you, Anya. Thank you for the very nice and perfect introduction. Um, I will start to give you insights. Uh, what are what is the motivation behind the job interview question? Um, as you told, I also announced it on LinkedIn because I think this is even more important than to go th go through um, questions and practice them. So you should see my screen now. Um, and now we will start. So just a few words about me. Anja, you told me, or uh, you, you told something about me already, but uh, so I, am, uh, I have more than 15 years of work experience now. Um, I'm responsible for HR matters at ACIP. Uh, the Excel, uh, Austrian Center of Industrial Biotechnology, and I am located now in Stivol in, in Styria. So here I am sitting in my keller, so cellar, uh, doing my presentation from here. So maybe just a few words about ASIP, because we heard it today, and Karina, she also uh, worked at ASIP during her master thesis, I think. So um, ASIP is a, a multidisciplinary disciplinary research center on the um, between science and industry. So we are no university, uh, but we are no, no industry, but we are working on cooperative industrial projects. So like the bridging the gap between science and industry. So maybe for the postdoc experience, this is a great uh, way to, to make it because here at ACB we already have get in touch with industrial partner and industrial problems. So Enough from employer branding, visit our homepage, I invite you. So let's get into the theme. What I would like to do with you is that you can stamp my screen. And I would like you I would, to show how this should work. This is in German because I am a German speaking one. So, But if you go with your mouse on the top of your screen, there should appear something like showing options or options. And then there should be the possibility to choose comment or commentieren. And then you should be able to stamp, stempeln, stamp. And then this should enable you to stamp my screen directly while I'm presenting. So maybe we will try it out here. So try it out. What's the weather like outside where you are sitting right now? Is it windy? Is the sun? shining, is it raining or snow? Maybe somebody from the Western Austria is here or you don't know because you're only sitting on your PC. 
So maybe you try to stamp. If it doesn't work, we will find another. <laughs> we will find another possibility to interact a little bit. Okay. I don't think that it works, that you, you are not able to stamp it. Mm. Um, so yeah, then write it in the chat. Then we will do it with the chat, maybe just to check in to warm up. So how are you a dog? Okay, we have three dogs here. <laughs> But I think it's very windy, yeah, for Western, for, for Eastern Austria and also here in Styria, it's very windy. So we also have a storm warning for tonight. Okay, so we are all these dogs here, mainly. <laughs> so get ready for the storm. In Vienna and in Styria, there is a warning yeah, tonight. Okay, so we will do the interaction then via chat. Okay, so just jump into uh, the theme. So what types of questions? So HR departments, when they are involved in the selection process, what they usually are, they have somehow a bundle of different questions. So a bundle of different uh, questions to ask. Um, if it's a bigger company, then they have it more professional. If it's a small company, it's more out of the stomach somehow, so like getting a feeling for the person. But if you are at, at BI, for example, and applying there, they have for sure um, a good plan what to ask you um, to find out if you are the right person for the right for this job. So just to give you a, a yeah, there are some so-called traditional questions. They are really old school. They don't really tell anything about you. So they are like, tell something about you. Or what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? Why should we hire you for this position? So this open question, these traditional questions, you can find them in job interviews, but they are more or less to check if the sympathy is okay and if you are prepared. So if you don't have an answer to these questions, it's hard to go to make a good first impression because this also shows that you didn't even Google <laughs> what type of job interview question you could expect. So my tip is here just to go, uh, yeah, do a Google research and take a look what they say. Um, for example, if you have the question, yeah, that's the classical one. What I think nobody asks this anymore. At least we don't ask this, but it's a very traditional one. Like, what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? So I put in the chat also a workbook. Maybe you found it. That's a PDF I prepared for another workshop. Um, no, I prepared only for you for this session now, <laughs> where you can find some more details on the things I'm telling you now and also some tips here. So for example, this strength or weaknesses questions, you will always find the tip, uh, don't tell your weaknesses. Tell a strength that has some negative points. So for example, um, I'm so perf perfectionistic and impatient with myself that I sometimes offend others. So if this fits for the position. So just don't say, oh no, oh my weaknesses. Oh, I know, I know, I'm so bad. Oh, don't answer this. Try to turn it around. Um, so, but there are more or less more to check if, you, if, if the symp sympathy fits and if you are prepared. Then there are so-called motivation questions. Uh, they want to figure out um, what motivates you. So, and if the company can also offer this to you, because it's always about the perfect match. You have to fit into a company and the company has to fit to you. So here um, it's one, one part is to find out if you are willing to perform and the other, on the other hand, uh, to find out what motivates you. So for example, these are questions like, uh, what does it take for you to really be in the flow and step on the gas within the scope of work, for example? Or my favorite one is, uh, let's say a fairy godmother offers you the job where you can't, can't stop smiling. What would this task look like? So what would this job be like? My tip here is try to make a connection to the position you are applying for. So when you're applying for a scientist and don't say with this uh, fairy godmother, oh, I would like to be an artist. <laughs> so <laughs> try to find something that's also fitting into this job, but be honest and authentic. 
it makes no sense to lie because then after a few months you have the big problem in the job because you don't fit there and then the most favorite the most common one nowadays um, are situational questions um, they are like, imagine you are in this, in, this, in this situation, how would you react? Like a little role play. Or think of a situation where it was important that teamwork worked out fine, for example. Um, because then here it, should be, it will be checked how you deal with challenges and uh, how is your behavior in certain situations. So, because these are the most um, common questions by now, so at least in the literature and at least in the, in the human resource departments, this is very, uh, is suggested to go into situational questions. I want to give you a tip here, how you can practice them somehow, because there is a clear um, line you should follow in answering such questions. This is so-called the STAR method. When you are asked such a, such a question, then describe the situation you were in, the tasks you were facing, the actions you took, and what was the result of the situation. And also you can add a reflection. So for example, one question might be, are you good at teamwork? And give, can you give an example uh, to this, how it worked out? So with this kind of question, somebody puts you in the past and wants to know from your history, how did you react in a situation that is important for us? So for example, at, for this position, teamwork is very important or challenging, maybe also, could also be. Um, and the interviewer wants to find out how do you deal with teamwork? So let's see at this question, for example, you could, situation, okay. During my studies, I had to do a research project with a group of fellow students. So this was the situation where you were confronted with teamwork. What were your tasks? So my task was to keep an overall view and make sure everyone completed their tasks on time. So that's something you had to do there. Then I created, for example, what did you do? What was your action? So how did you behave with this responsibility? So you, I created an overview of all tasks and deadlines and made sure everyone made the deadlines. And what was the result? It was great. No, I did a good job. And if you would like, you can also add a reflection. So for example, there was something that didn't work out fine, but I learned from this. So this situational question. So, if, so remember um, when you were in a situation where you had to deal with I don't know, unfriendly colleagues, for example, or whatever fits for the interview that, that he or she asks you uh, when it goes in this direction. So remember a situation where you, then keep this in mind, this star rule, because then you can answer really structured and in a good way. My tip. Yes, and now one short question, which I answered already. Uh, <laughs> I would like to stamp, but that's not possible, but you can write it in the chat. So if you were a pizza, what would be your topic? Topping, not topic, topping. Let's see. Unfortunately, I have here two answers, three. So we have Diavolo, Ananas, Ham and Cheese, Top Middle, Rucola and Pecorino. Okay, so we have very different Pepperoncino or a hot one. Okay. <laughs> right bottom. Okay, that's fungi, mushrooms. Okay. Chili. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so when you get such a question, your reaction will be, like this, huh? <laughs> what the hell? But this type of questions get more popular. Popular. They are called paradox questions. Um, these paradox questions sound very freak freaky. They can also be, for example, do you often, okay, that's really, can you sell me this pen? Or 
Um, are you willing to live in a shared flat with colleagues? Or would you fill a tank even if it was already full? Or yeah, uh, what role in the sports club do you associate your, your leaders, leadership position with, for example? So completely out of the frame. Um, so this margarita thing or this pizza thing is really, really out of the frame. Could be also if you were a fruit. Um, but they have, I like to ask them if I'm allowed to. So I ask also the always the working group leader if I'm allowed to, but I like them um, because they show the creativity. How do you deal? More important than the answer of this question is how you deal with this question. So like, huh, I will never ask such, uh, answer such a stupid question, for example, is uh, not the best way to react. And it also should check your analytical skills. It's because the next question after what topping would you have would be and why. So for example, pepperoncini, because I have fire, uh, because I'm fully motivated or like me and Margarita, classical, but good. So to put this into a connection somehow to your um, habits. My tip is here, um, react with, oh, this is, for example, to, to gain time. This is a good question. And then breathe and then, then answer. But to take some time for you. So this type of questions I'm, I commonly asked if the position is somehow related with creativity skills um, and with yeah, getting to know you. So I like them even in, so I like them in science also because it somehow puts out your real personality. <laughs> okay, the breakers, oh, sorry. I wanted to do this, but I, we won't do this because it's not possible. I have to announce it before when we want to do breakout sessions. So we will do it in another way. Um, so in the breakout session, I would ask you the question because you're all studying. So for example, if, if in the interviews, somebody asks you, but you're already aware that studying is absolutely unnecessary for a professional advancement. Then this is called a stress interview a question might be used. It comes from uh, the military. Um, and in this case, somebody wants to check your reaction. Sorry, and I have some problems with the animation. Okay, no, yes. So for example, this can also be, don't you think this position is a bit above your abilities? So this is something the interview asks you to provocate you, to get you out, your personality somehow, to check your reaction and if you are secure or not. Maybe these questions are useful um, when you are applying for a leadership position, for example. So how do you deal in stress situations? Do you freak out or do you stay calm? Um, I don't like them personally because it also reflects something from the company culture, how the interviewer, how the company deals with you. Because I think that's not fair to put somebody under stress, but they might be there. So if this uh, comes along in a job interview, don't freak out. <laughs> think, okay, this is now a stress interview question and I won't give you the chance to see me to freak out. I stay calm. Um, and then you can think if you even want to work there. <laughs> so my tip here is you might use the phrase, um, the opposite is the case, and then answer something different. So for example, don't you think this position is a bit above your ability, abilities? Please say the opposite is the case. I'm perfectly qualified and I'm highly motivated and I'm sure that I can do the tasks perfectly. So this, the op opposite is the case is a trick from public relation. Uh, when politicians uh, get confronted, maybe now we have no uh, government courts anymore, but when we had that government, <laughs> you heard this a lot. So das Gegenteil ist der Fall in German. The opposite is the case. So this is the tip from public relation experts um, to react on questions you can't deal with. 
the opposite is the case and then say something completely different that doesn't even have to do with the thing that somebody asked you. And then there are some other type of questions also. Um, so, bio, but they are not so spectacular, let's say it that way. <laughs> Um, that's uh, that are biography uh, questions. This is like um, taking the best profit of the future is the past. So the interviewer takes a look at your CV and takes a look in what situations you were and asks you, for example, how was it at um, Boku when you studied there? So going back in your history, but they are more like, yeah, that's not really tricky. So there's no bigger plan behind it, uh, but just to hear you talking and to, yeah, maybe a real interest in the position, what we had there. Then the CV related questions. Okay, they are like, um, you did some things in show, shown in your CV, so you can do something, the, but the, the, the position affords this type of skills and do the fit to find this out. So the CV related questions. Uh, so tell me something about your CV. What was your position there? What did you do there? They want to check if you can yeah, get have the skills needed uh, for this position. My tip here is when you're asked, tell me something about your CV, then don't retell your CV because they read it already. Try to make a somehow a little bit a story out of it. Let's say it that way. So what I really enjoy working in a dynamic uh, work environment. I love science and the creativity there. Therefore, I started to work this and this. So just try not only, okay, I started after my studies, I made this and this and this, because this is like everybody can read. Try to tell why you did it. And, and, and yeah, and you can practice this in a really good way um, because you know your CV. And that's also a question I like to ask because this is more than like, tell me something about you. Um, uh, so concrete, tell me your CV, what, what, what was the most important thing to hear somebody speaking. And then the realistic job interview uh, is it's called. So this is like, um, these are the benefits of the job. These are the negative points of the job and yeah that's the way can you deal with it and you can decide so like giving you the interview gives you a preview in your future work environment in your future tasks and really tells you okay this is the positive thing but you have to face also this and this you have to deal with stress you have to do something with the customer or something like this um, and so how does this sound to you? And this is really a realistic thing. There is no trap, no trick. Um, I like this also. So I do this also. So to, yeah, because it's about the perfect match. I said that before. <laughs> it is not useful to, or it's not good to um, hire somebody who leaves after one or two months, because that's the most expensive thing that can happen uh, for an employer because then the position has to be re-announced, the selection process has to be again done, the onboarding and so on. So it's not in the interest of the employer as well as not in your interest to go into a job or a job profile where you don't fit in. Yes, so these are the, the insights into the type of questions. I have then also prepared some other slides if you have time, but maybe we make here a, a break um, and try and yeah, give the possibility to ask something. So do you have questions? Yes, there is a question in the chat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, would you say that besides the major... Oh no, there is, I think that's a question for the previous okay. presenter. Are there any questions for Julia maybe? 
Uh, Fiona wrote, okay, there is, but maybe first of all, uh, Fiona wrote that there is another possibility to answer the stress question. I hope it's a bit above my current abilities so I can grow into it and be challenged, but I'm sure I have the right abilities and attitude just now to handle it. Yes, what do you this, say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to, to this concrete stress question, yes, that's a good mm -hmm. answer. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But I love challenges, challenges, and I'm, yes, that's a good answer to this. Mm -hmm. So there is a question uh, by Melanie. Mm -hmm. How to best react if someone asks an inappropriate question, like, do you have a partner to figure out the woman's family planning, etc.? Um, don't answer. It depends. Um, so interviewers are not allowed to ask these questions. Um, but yeah, you won't go to, to court because you asked this kind of question. So usually this should not be asked. Um, I would never ask it because it's not allowed. My tip to deal with it is I would in I would say as, as a woman and in my experience, what would make an impression on me is that that I would say self-confident that this kind of question is not appropriate. And what has my partner to do with this? Or this is my private, private thing. But it's, or you are also allowed to lie. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But if it's really an inappropriate, inappropriate question, I would say this. Because there's also somebody else asked me or told me uh, that somebody asked uh, her um, what her father says that she applies for this job. <laughs> so these are really inappropriate questions and you can really also answer that this is an inappropriate question. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, there is another question by Julia. Mm -hmm. uh, is it a good sign to receive a paradox question because the interviewers are interested in the applicant, applicant, applicant or are you asking them, them to anyone even if the interview is going badly? No, I don't ask them everyone. So if it's going good, and for me personally, then I answer, uh, ask also a paradox question. If it works out not fine, then I will not do it because then it makes no sense to get more in deeper contact somehow. So I can say from my personal experience, yes, it's a good question, a good, good sign. If it's asked at the f as the first question, then yeah, it's no sign. But if it's asked during the question, but just that you don't wonder, I wanted to I wanted to tell you that this are this is a trend in the HR departments to go in this direction also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how about the compensation package? When is it a good time and strategy to deal with the issue? Um, the compensation package is uh, not really a job interview question. Um, uh, when it's asked, it depends. Maybe there is a second round. Maybe it's not even addressed. Um, if it's not asked in the interview, from the interviewer, I would not really ask for it. Usually it is asked or it's, it, it is a point that you can discuss or you can talk about. So if it comes to the timeline, then yes, talk about it. Um, if it's not even asked by the interviewer, then there's, the usual, there's usually a second round or something like this, or it's completely clear what to pay. But from your side to tell you, yeah, let's talk about the money is a little bit tricky. But usually after the questions, then there is, okay, you saw we, we will pay this and that. And what is your expect, uh, expectation? Or what do you expect? Is this fine for you? Um, then you can go into the dis discussion. Mm -hmm. Or do you mean from an interviewer point? Or from the interviewer or who, when you get interviewed? Okay, let's yeah. go. Uh, it's coming yes. back. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you want more questions or are you ready to uh, continue with your presentation? Because mm -hmm. we have three more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. So 
uh, one example of stress question uh, Ayla um, posted is, aren't you overqualified for this position? So how would you advise us to react uh, when asked this question? The opposite is the case because there are so many things and aspects in this position I didn't uh, deal by now and I want to see how an industry comp industrial company works or so like yeah the opposite is the case no not no that's not correct because when you say that's not correct then you criticize your interview partner <laughs> um, but when you say no the opposite is the case um, there are so many things um, that the company could offer me where I can go deeper into it or I want to step I want to step one step back to learn this from the beginning, for example. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and Leila is wondering what questions are wise to ask the uh, person who is in interviewing you? So the interviewee. Sorry, I didn't get the question. Uh, what questions are wise to ask, ask as okay. an interviewee? Okay, we will come, we, we can come to this later on, uh, but it's um, like um, you yeah, get prepared um, and take a look at the employer. You take a look at the company you are applying for and uh, ask questions um, where the company has the feeling that you have dealt with it. For example, I have a, a slide for this also. We can go there then um, about the company culture. Take a look at um, Kununu, where you find the company, where you, um, so what about flexible working hours, for example? Or, yeah, don't embarrass the one you are asking. <laughs> so like your strategy sounds pretty uh, uh, annoying or, or not sure, or I'm not sure what the company is really dealing with. So don't embarrass your <laughs> interview partner, but show interest. Um, also, what about home office, home working? Um, everything is, is somehow allowed. Um, everything which you're interested in. The questions you are asking shows what are your interests. So if the first thing uh, you ask is um, if you can work from home, then this question shows the interview partner that this is the most important thing for you. If that's good or not, I don't know. So try to think what is the most important thing for you to know and start with this question. Because for me, this is very important. What is the first question? Because this is for me, uh, I see what is the most important thing. So if the first question is what about the uh, development possibilities, then I know, okay, that's going, yeah. <laughs> there is somebody who wants to make career can be good or, or not, but be aware of that. The first question might be the most important, should be the most important for you. Thank you, Julia. And mm -hmm. Dina is wondering, when is the best time point to apply for a position? Months or half a year before you finish, for example, one PhD? Uh, usually companies want you to start to work immediately. <laughs> if they have a position open, the usually, so in, in business, you usually have a six week of notice period. So if you're not coming directly from the study, so if you're from another employer, so this is the period every interviewer, every company thinks they can wait six weeks because this is the usual notice term period. Nobody expects you to work to start on the next day usually. Uh, but six months before is a little bit early. It, it, because even if you are the right person for this job, the company might not want to or is not able to wait six months that you can start because they need to, to have somebody now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And maybe now last question. Mm -hmm. uh, which uh, For which things, details, are you personally watching out when receiving a CV application and also during the interview, for example, body language? Mm -hmm. uh, when I receive a CV, I love, I love structure so that I can really uh, figure out what were, what were the main stations. So a structured one. 
Um, this is the CV. What I, if you add, uh, that's my tip. If you add um, a letter to it, uh, so a motivation letter or somebody like um, or something like that, uh, writing something to it, then don't start with to whom it may concern or dear lady, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is very unpersonal and for especially to whom it may concern. That's really like, yeah, I'm writing this to 100 companies and you are one of the list. And yeah, <laughs> that's my tip in the, in the motivation letter or in the letter you, you put to your CV. Uh, during the interview, I made a lot uh, virtual now, but during the interview, so the body language, uh, the whole appearance, let's call it that way. So it, it's also different what kind of position we are looking for. If you are looking for, let's call it a computer nerd, then it's not really important um, Yeah, how the one looks like or if you're working in the lab and so on. But self-confidence um, that you, yes, that's, that you are prepared for the interview, that you're not just jumped out of bed because uh, now I have the interview. So like um, putting a, not a suit, but a jean and a polo, for example, um, on and have clean shoes <laughs> just to show um, respect or like appreciation or thank you that I was invited. Not because it's then so important when you work uh, there maybe, but it depends on the position. So, but I have no checklist for the body language. It's the whole appearance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are more questions coming. I don't know, mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's time you continue the presentation. No, we can, we can go like on because the other things are add-ons. So okay. they're not really related sure. with the type of questions. Mm -hmm. yeah? And uh, if you do not have a contact, but it's part of the, of a HR system, how would you begin the letter of motivation, for example? Um, uh, dear personnel or recruiting team, um, dear HR department, um, something like this, or you can find it out. Uh, maybe they have a career page. Usually companies have a career page. Maybe you find their, um, the responsible person, um, yes. It's a puzzle piece. It's not the most important thing. So if you don't know, or maybe in the application, so in the job offer, you also find the name. That's That could also be possible. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I if you don't have on the dear HR team, dear recruit, recruiting team or something like this. Mm -hmm. But dear that, madam and sirs, also okay, not but not to whom it may concern. No. <laughs> okay, then I guess we, you also answered Julia's question by answering this. <laughs> so she wondered how to find out whom to address in a motivation letter. Usually only a branch of the company is named in. Mm -hmm. Yes, are there any other questions in the chat maybe in the meantime? Yes, we can, we can mm -hmm. come later also. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I will, this is now bonus, more or less. Um, so, but also important and as I, yeah, I wanted to give you something like how to prepare for a job interview. Um, yes, this is, you never get a second chance for a first impression, sorry. Um, and what this is my personal message. <laughs> my really, really personal message and I want everybody to hear is, is storytelling. The most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. Um, so that does not mean you have to lie, you have to lie, but try to put your CV into a story. Try to put uh, the why, why are you the right candidate for this position in a story for you? Um, why do you want this job? Be aware of this story. It, nobody maybe will ask you, tell your story. <laughs> that would be a very fancy question. But if you have this in mind, then you can answer also the questions better. So why are you 
try to tell yourself the story why I am the perfect person for this job. Why do I want this job? And try to find this out. And here one, one tip. I won't do this, do this. We won't look that video, but I can really, really uh, recommend it to you. Simon Sinek, I don't know if you know, it, know him. Um, he's a bestseller author and he, this, he's really great. It's about um, how inspiring people communicate. And they always put the why first. So why am I doing this? Why does a company do this? Um, and then the what, and then the how. So start with the why. This is my personal message. So why am I applying? What is the sense? You can take a look at the, at the video, uh, but we won't take a look now. Um, and regarding uh, storytelling, I just want to give you, just think about it. Maybe it's not yours, then forget it. But just maybe think about it. It's also about scientific storytelling. You can also use this if you present a poster or if you're talking about your science. It's the so-called uh, four sentence rule. Um, it starts with a statement. For example, I am the perfect person for this job. This is a statement. Then you give a reason because my whole life, I was working to get into such a position, for example. So I'm improving uh, now. Then one exa example or story uh, that underlines your statement and a conclusion or a call for action. For example, this is why you should hire me. You find also an example in the workbook. But this is the for sentence rule or storytelling. Here you find just assertion proof examples and call for actions. If you go on a scientific communication uh, webinar, um, a modern one, um, then you will find this also there. So start with a statement and tell the story. Then also very important for me, also a personal management uh, message from my side is it's all about the perfect match. So from both sides from you and from the employer. Um, and therefore, maybe you can activate a little bit the Sherlock Holmes uh, in you to, when, when you prepare for a job interview. What do I mean with this? Um, take a look at the company culture. Um, where do you find something? How the company? So the company culture is meant. Um, what does the company? Uh, so how does it present itself? Uh, is it collegial? Uh, do they have a, a very strict hierarchy? Do they have um, young people, older people? Okay, where do you find this out? You can check Kununu, for example. Um, there, I don't know if everybody knows Kununu or Glassdoor. Um, these are employer rated portals uh, where. Uh, Real employees give insights. They are not uh, given from the company. So when you go to the AC page, you, we can't influence what people write there. We can only react <laughs> to the things they write there. So this is, these are real insights. Um, for example, yes, if you are, if you are um, applying at PI, uh, it's pretty hard maybe to find the company culture because there are many divisions. Uh, but maybe you know somebody via LinkedIn who works there from, from, from the OG MBD network, the ILSA, for example, then call or something like this. No? Um, then take a look at the career page, um, the employer branding. So what does the company want you um, to think about the company? The employer branding is the marketing of a, of a company. So there, there are the key messages on the career pages, what they want you uh, to think why this is a great employer. This might also be a good starting point to ask questions. So when they say in the employer branding, uh, we, we, we appreciate the flexible work surrounding, then you can ask what does this mean in detail. So I think I like that. I like I like that aspect. Uh, maybe could you give me an example or something like this? Yes, questions. <laughs> think of questions. Then the salary. 
if it comes to the compensation package. Then be aware what you want to earn. So make a salary comparison. So you should know what you want to earn. Um, you can find also on Konuno, if you registered there, you can find a salary check. So you can type in postdoc position in Vienna in the field of, and then you get a, somehow a range. What is the salary in this position? Um, and then please tell the yearly cross salary. I put it here in many languages because this is not the net you want to earn, but the gross salary. So before deduction of tax and before deduction of uh, social contribution. Um, this is something to do with professionality. <laughs> because if you say the net, the net um, salary, th this is something that's really important for you because this is the thing that is in your purse after the month. But it's very, very hard uh, to influence the concrete amount from the employer, because it depends if you have a family allowance, if you have this and this and this and this, 1,000 things. So yes, be aware what you want to earn net, but then calculate it to the cross salary. You can do this in, in Austria. We have so-called brutto netto rechner from the Arbeiterkammer. There you can calculate it back to what does this mean in a cross salary. And you can also ask uh, for, I don't know if everybody knows what fringe benefits are, social, uh, freiwillige Sozialleistungen. Many companies offer that once, that's, that are things like public transportation, uh, that the public transportation, the climate ticket is paid, um, or that you get food vouchers. So these are things you get uh, uh, without ta tax de deduction and could be nice benefits. But usually you find if companies offer fringe benefits, you find this on the career page because then they are proud <laughs> that they do it. But consider, but think also about that one because this is really something also very nice and can make a difference if you go only for the salary and compare two employers. Also these fringe benefits that are offered can make a difference. Yes, and then... The last point I would have prepared is who to face in a job interview. Maybe we can just walk through. Um, and this is, I'm from my basic uh, education. I'm a tax consultant. And this is my most uh, favorite answer is, was always, it depends. <laughs> and this is also the answer on this who to face. It depends. Um, but just to make, to give you an idea who you could face. Um, you could face the line manager, so your direct uh, supervisor, the HR department, um, maybe also, um, sorry, at the works council. Um, in some cases, even the CEO, so the chief of the company, or sometimes also colleagues, future colleagues could be in a job interview. Okay, so this tells you nothing. So everybody somehow. <laughs> um, but it depends on the size of the company on the one hand, um, who you usually face. If it's a small company, um, it might be possible, a really, really small small one. So if you go for in, to a startup, for example, um, it is not unlikely that you see there the CEO because in this small size, he or she wants to get sure to get the right people with the right spirit and mindset and your line manager probably. Usually they don't have an HR department at all that's dealing with this. In a bigger company, it's most likely to face the HR department and, the, and your line manager. And in a big, big, big company, it also might be possible that uh, the works council is their Betriebsrat. But they are usually there to, to make sure that everything runs uh, correctly. Um, and that you're not discriminated and so on. Then it might also then it also depends on the selection process. So if there is a first round, a second round, and a third round, for example, might be that there are more rounds. Then you usually 
see in the first round the HR department, HR department only. So you don't maybe don't even meet your supervisor, your future supervisor, because they make somehow a dropout. No? Checking the formal criteria, the first impression, and then you go further uh, to the line manager. And then maybe if there's a third round, because it's a really high position, you meet there than the CEO. And also be aware that it might be possible that you don't even see the company in the first round, because there are a lot of recruiting consultants around there uh, doing the recruiting for the companies. Um, you might see also that, that you, sometimes you don't even know for what company you are applying for in the job announcement. And it also might be possible that you are at this recruiting consultant doing the job of the HR department, so like sorting out hard checklists, checking something. And my tip is here, ask. If you're invited to a job interview, then you're an interesting candidate, and then you can also ask, sorry, but I would be interested who I will face in the job interview. That's no, that's a good question, even <laughs> because I want to prepare or something like this, or just you want to know. But what I can tell you is what the roles of the different people might be in a job interview. So if you face, if you meet you, if you meet your line manager, your future supervisor, then there is clearly the expertise in the focus. Um, take a look if you fit into his team, if the expertise is, is fine. The HR department uh, usually is there to tell you the conditions, so to talk about the compensation and benefits, uh, to present uh, the uh, company from an, as an employer that's the best employer of the world <laughs> and that you should get no money to work here because it's so great to work here somehow. No, joking. Uh, but the more or less, if, it, if the HR department is also there, there's most that the role is the conditions. If you meet the CEO, then it's going to the direction to fit vision. Do you fit into the vision, into the mindset of the company, into the targets the company has? So you had, there you are on a strategic level somehow. And a colleague, a future colleague, that's, that's the cultural fit. Sometimes I also invite co future colleagues with the aim, take a look if the, if the chemistry fits, if you if the person fits into your team, if you feel comfortable. And the works council, I told you already, they are more or less to, to take a look at the process that everything runs fine. Yeah. Okay, half past five. <laughs> we are in time. Okay. <laughs> so we can... Again, make, make we have yeah some minutes or thirty minutes for questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is already one question in the chat. Mm -hmm. Do we have examples of really outstanding points in a CV or motivation letter? Outstanding. In the motivation letter, I'm happy when I have the feeling that this, that the person has read the position <laughs> and uh, takes um, and really uh, tells me the strengths and why the strengths do fit into this position. So to make the connection between the advertised position and the motivation letter. So this position really sounds like I'm getting challenged and I'm a person who really likes, loves to get challenged. Um, so making, telling a story fitting to the to the job description we are we are looking at so really something completely outstanding mm, no no i can't think of something where we're really 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 impressed and i have to share with you so i'm impressed from motivation letters that take uh yeah that are related to the job position we have advertised and where I see that the candidate already took a look at the homepage from our company. But I think that's, but 
there is a current trend also because we have also here young scientists and I would like to discuss this also with you. Um, that companies in the war of talents uh, switch to application processes done by WhatsApp chatbots. So that you get um, people to apply. Because if you're not BI or if you're not Sando, so if you don't have such a big employer branding thing where everybody wants to work there, it's getting harder to find, to find people. In science, so in our related positions, we don't really now see this war of talents, but I think that in the next 10, five to 10 years, also in this case, there will be there will be things. What do you think about the selection process, the, the application process? Should it be easier to apply? Or are you willing to invest time when you apply for a position? So like doing with chatbots, only getting questions. So you can see, for example, the, 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 the job announcement in the tram and you can apply immediately <laughs> for this job position. You can write short answers in the chat. Yeah. Or un unmute yourself, of course, if you want yeah. to speak up. <laughs> yeah. But you can also ask me questions, so no problem. It's not really authentic. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. Okay, willing to invest time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Because we were thinking about this uh, in the scientific uh, area, but I, yes, but I think this is not a really good idea in the scientific framework. So if you're looking for PhD students or scientists, I don't think that this is the right format. Yeah, willing to meet real people. Yes, you would meet then real people in the company when you are invited to the job interview, not, <laughs> but the uh, the application form. There's a, a big trend uh, in in this to go into this direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was another question somewhere mm -hmm. up here. Uh, how long does the job interview last? Oh, that that also depends. That depends. In in our case, so when we are hiring PhD students or scientists, usually the first round is about 20 minutes, not to, to get the first idea. Then maybe there's a second round where we go in more detail, but not more than 30 minutes in our case. So you heard from uh, Karina um, that she had six, six hours uh, job interview. That sounds like a little assessment center um, she had. Um, so in our case, in a small company, smaller company, we have 200 employees, 30 minutes. And if we want you to prepare something, you know it before. So if you need to do a presentation or something like this. I think Kevin wants, wants to ask something. So Kevin, you can unmute yourself and speak up, of course. Hey, Julia, thanks um, hey. for the talk. So I was just curious when having the interview with the HR department, I guess that you already had some interviews before. So you they're actually quite considering to taking you. Then if you haven't talked about the salary range before, how much can you then overshoot kind of, you know, knowing that you already have a kind of a good chance to getting the position and they want you and the HR person is more there to actually, you know, get you on board with their conditions, how much can you shoot over what your actual range is or what you think you will get? Thanks. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I would say, say something realistic, not like, 30% more because I'm I think they will we can then come together on a lower amount like really negotiating going into a with a big big salary and then we will fit together at a at a realistic amount this is not really useful um so be aware what you want to earn and what your position is worth 
So really do this salary check. I would really recommend you to get an idea what under, what companies uh, pay in these uh, positions. Usually you find the job advertisement a minimum salary. Um, this minimum salary is, is the minimum salary, but I would say more than 30% of this minimum salary is really unusual. Does yeah. this answer your question anyway? Yeah, I was just curious, you know, when I say my range would be 40 to 50,000 per year. Yeah. Then um, if I have the meeting with the HR department, mm -hmm. if, I mean, I should go to, uh, let's say something that is completely in the middle, like 45 or, or 50, or if it doesn't really make a difference for them, if I say first 60 and they're like, no, no, that's not in our range. But what we were expecting was like 45 and you, it doesn't make a difference then, you know, not that I'm probably underselling myself. Maybe yeah, if you have the range 40 to 50, I would go in with 50, not okay. with 60. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes. I also, I heard the story that um, also from the other side that there was a job interview and the guy and they told him the salary and the guy just stood up and left the room. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, Anmig, you can ask the question by unmuting yourself if you want to, if that's what you are raising hand for. Is a uh, mention to me? Yes, we can. Hear you. <laughs> Hi. Okay. Um, thank you, Yulia. So uh, I, I have a. Uh, very straight and directly a uh, question because I, I would like to before the question I'd like to share a little bit my own story. I think uh, half a year no five months ago I start a search for a job here around. As from my name, as you can say, uh, I'm working in Medical University of Innsbruck and I'm, I'm from China. Uh, I sent out my applications to many companies. Uh, well, unfortunately, unfortunately, almost no uh, interview invitation. So my boss, my uh, the head of the institute, and the colleagues around all said must be something wrong. I did. So currently, the whole institute are reviewing my application documents, and I, every one of them said it's fine, it's fine. For them, they said it's it's quite okay. CV is great, motivation natural. Everything fine, but uh, they also curious why is no uh, interview invitation even. That's that's interesting, and they also even check my the positions what I applied, and to try to fit to my CV. They said it's quite match, and is that because my question is is that because I'm a foreigner? Uh, I how to say I can speak German, but not that good. Um, for, as an HR, is that the very critical part for you to judge a candidate or uh, really the background of your, or, or your ability, your publication, whatever, others, and or, yeah, that's, that's the question, how many chance for a foreigner to get? There is a um, it's not allowed to discriminate people because of their nationality, first of all. But for sure, you can tell when you're not even get invited and who to judge. Um, so in our case, we are an international uh, research, research center. We take every application from every nation under consider consideration, so it makes no difference. If your CV is good and your publication track, for example, is good and so on. But I heard it also from other sides that there was an open discrimination, like you don't get, you don't have a visa, so we can't apply, we can't um, onboard you. Um, so in reality, unfortunately, in some yeah, cases, that's some not my case. Yeah. yeah, actually, I'm the uh, permanent residence here, so it's open. Um, so for the work positions, it's open. Really, I was. Um, a little bit interesting stories my colleagues 
some of them even use my CV as templates to, to generate theirs. And they start uh, two weeks, uh, two months ago, some, uh, some start two weeks ago. Those people are even get invitation, some of already got the position. So that's, that's the very, for me, I cannot say it's negative because I, I can understand all over the world is the same. Uh, bec- uh, two of two colleagues of me, if my already got use my CV as templates to apply positions, they got the, off- the offer already. And several of them are in the interview phase, but I still waiting for the interview invitation. So that's the, um, I even put a paid some company to generate my documents, but still, I don't know what the reason. Uh, that's a little bit uh, kind of like negative um, example. But I myself is pos- uh, quite positive because I have a. Um, I'm working at a good institute. They offer me a job to when I, when I get the position next. Would be my my tip also apply at not companies but at research institutions. For example, also for EU projects, because there you have to declare that you are um, uh, that you have um, that you don't discriminate people <laughs> from other companies from other countries. And if you have then work experience in Austria at an institute well known in Austria, then it's maybe another. It's I don't know maybe a difference. Yeah, sorry, I'm That's sorry that sorry that. Question, yeah. Oh I'm God. sorry that this is your experience. It should not be. So it's not allowed in Austria to discriminate people because due to their nationality. No, I, I don't say they discriminate, but I, I just no, don't know the, the, the reason why. I suppose my CV is quite okay. Publication check. Also, I cannot say the best of our, from our institute, almost the, the first class, I am, but still um, waiting for the invitation of the interviews. But Anyway, thank you very much. But maybe for you answer. can. Um, so I think that you give o- OGMBT has uh, a career fair planned, but they also do CV checks. Maybe you can use this one if you're interested in just to get an and an yeah, yeah, that's if, good in- good information. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll keep my eyes on. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And you're interested. Maybe there you. Yeah. yeah, yeah thank you. You have input. Yeah. You're welcome. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are two more questions in the chat. <laughs> One of them by Jakob. Uh, how much polishing should can you do in a, do in your application? I have done X, but only for a couple of weeks and or within a university course internship. Obviously, you have to be very clear in the interview. Polishing, yeah, that it shines, <laughs> but it's there. Uh, so don't lie, but highlight. So this is also a tip maybe for the CV if you've done a lot of um, internships or if you've, if you've done a lot of practicals uh, outside of your study, highlight those that are relevant for the job. So your CV does not have to uh, have include everything you did before you had your degree, uh, but it should uh, in, has everything that might be relevant to show that you have the qualification for this job. Uh, I have done X, but only for a couple of weeks and always in a university. Don't, you have done X. Yes. So don't put there that you only have done it in a couple of weeks, only a few weeks. If it's important for the job profile, um, then tell it. You don't have to add that you only done it for a couple of weeks. If they ask you in the job interview, then you should not lie. Mm-hmm. Um, there is one question by Jose. Is there an information source you would recommend to get proper info on the hiring practices culture in the DAH area? Um, what culture? Sorry, the. DACH, D-A-C-H area. Ah, Deutschland, Österreich. Yeah, DACH, Deutschland, Österreich, Schweiz. The hiring practices culture. I 
not sure. So, so there is no homepage I can recommend where you can find insights uh, on recruiting processes in the Dach area. Um, because this is also something the companies not, not, not always share in detail. So sorry. I'm sorry, I can't give you here an information source. Um, maybe also Kununo or the Glassdoor because their applicants only also can um, evaluate the application process. So people going there, or even if they didn't get hired, they can give a feedback there unasked <laughs> how the application process was. Yeah, but there's no really internet source where I could, that I can recommend. I don't know one where you can really get a good overview about the hiring practices. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome. And apparently one last question by Julia. Is, there, is it possible to offend the company by wanting too much compensation? So losing the job opportunity because of that? Yes, if it's completely unrealistic. Because when I have a job where we can pay 40,000 euros per year and the applicant tells me he wants to earn 80,000 euros per year, then this is so far away from something we can offer that we don't have to discuss because we won't be able to meet. And if we could then agree on 50,000, I will know I know from my perspective that we will have the discussion in one year again. Um, so if it's completely incoherent, then yes. Mm -hmm. And Jose then asks, uh, could you spell the first website, not the glass door, but I can write it down also, it's Kununu. Kununu. Yeah, okay, yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, are there any more questions from the audience? I would still like to invite you to fill in the feedback form for Julia, for her presentation and for sharing her tips and tricks. Uh, yeah, I guess no more questions. Welcome, I enjoyed it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> then I guess it's time for us to close this event. 